And uh, now, without further ado, I uh, am happy to introduce, once again, Herb Adams here to uh, a lot of friends and acquaintances of the Historical Society. Uh, we're playing on the theme of two this year. Uh, it's been two years since Herb has been here. Uh, he's back again. Uh, we are celebrating the 102nd, 152nd birthday of C.A. Stevens. Herb is going to talk about C.A. Stevens' second wife. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get her dates to work out with a, with a second. So I did find, realize that C.A. Stevens' first wife, Christine, was born just two years and two days after C.A. Stevens. So we have to mention that in terms of accessory plus two. Uh, and uh, finally, with regard to the theme of two, uh, another deadline required us to get uh, information out in the mail to the newspapers as to what the title of this evening's talk would be. Uh, I asked her what it was. He said he hadn't thought one up yet. Uh, just make something up, he said. So I said, how about the two lives of Madame Scalar? He said, that sounds fine. So I'm anxious to hear how he managed to <laughs> make that title work. Thank you. You uh, will be happy to know, Larry, that no sooner did I hang up the phone from you than I picked up a news clip which referred to Madame Scalar as the second Nordica. <laughs> so therefore, we indeed do have a, a uh, direct connection. I'd like to dedicate tonight's uh, talk to two dear people, Mr. Dennis DeLay and my father, Herbert Adams, who uh, have passed on now. But along with my dear friend John Morrison of Thomaston and Esther Nava, and her sister now of Norway Lake, comprised the original Norway Lake gang of kids who were the luckiest kids in the whole world because every other kid on earth had to read the farm stories and wonder who this person was who wrote them for the youth's companion. Whereas of all the children on earth, my father and Dennis and John and Esther and her sister were his neighbors and his friends. They were the envy of all the world had the world known about them and had they known what the world thought of C.A. Stevens. I consider it a great privilege to be uh, a member of the, the Norway Lake gang <clears throat> in its last generation. Uh, having grown up there, gone to the red schoolhouse, it was yellow then, gone to the yellow schoolhouse, had the privilege of studying in the room where C.A. Stevens sometimes taught, where his daughter, Edna, did occasionally teach, where Janet sometimes substituted the school, where my own mother, Pauline, sitting in the back next to the back row, often was my own school teacher, let me tell you, that was a mixed blessing, because if you were one red crayon short, you know, who didn't get it. <laughs> I cannot remember a time where I didn't know there had been such a person as C.A. Stevens. I cannot imagine not having heard about him from the grown-ups who surround you when you are a little kid. Norway is a kind of little town, and I was the sort of little kid that would sit in the corner of the porch on the summer evenings with the yellow light on so that it wouldn't attract too many bugs or bats, and listen to the old folks while they would talk, and had the great opportunity to hear my own grandmother, Mabel, Mabel Lillian Frost Adams Cummings. Does anybody remember my grandmother Cummings? Tell me if Miss Tucker, of course, would. Ben Tucker's, uh, well, Wes Tucker, of course, and his mother lived just up the hill from us. And I can well remember Ben, uh, Wes Tucker and my father on early spring evenings, I could watch from my bedroom window as they would burn the field in the spring so that the fresh grass would have a start. And I have distinct memories of the great crescent of fire rolling slowly up the hill as they would stand below the window and smoke their pipes. You could smell the, the aroma of the tobacco and the you know, serious men talk going on and seeing that circle of flames head up toward the stars at the top of the hill. A wonderful memory. And one I think that C.A. Stevens would have appreciated. Tonight, however, our conversation is about Madame Scalar, a friend of my father's, a friend of Esther's, a friend of her sister's, a friend of Dennis's, and a friend of John's. And in uh, absentia, in the second generation, a friend of my own. But we start at an end. It was nearest to a castle that Norway had ever known, and folks flowed to the hilltop in the early morning. For the first time, no resident remained to look out from the great tower down to the lake framed by the rocking pines. All the victrollers were silent. The records were piled on the lawn. Books were heaped by them. Beloved chairs were empty forever, set outside. Bric-a-brac, treasures, trivia, vases, vaults, oak bureaus, three-person <coughs> long golden oak desks, microscopes, telescopes, Tiffany lamps, a great amethyst crystal, given by 
George Howe to the couple on the occasion of C.A. Stevens' second marriage. Clothes, trunks, opera props, costumes, a lampshade made out of an opera costume. What would we get to have that lampshade today? The loves and the loot of two lives were all piled out on the lawn. The occupants gone forever. All of these things to be scattered to the winds of countless new lives. Well, it's an ending and a beginning. This is where we begin. I've tried to describe, using newspaper articles, the great sale that took place on the mansion lawn at C.A. Stevens's in the early 1950s, before I was there to see it. But we should also look back a step further than that, to 90 years ago, tonight, this very night, 90 years ago, because standing on the stage of Covent Garden and singing was the daughter of the Oxford Hills, Madame Scalard. On the 17th of October, 1906, Madame Scalard, born Minnie Plummer in West Paris, Maine, opened at Covent Garden in the great Verdi opera Aida and was performing it again this very evening, 90 years ago. We'll come back to that in a moment, but now we must take a further step back in time to a remarkable life because she took the eight notes, two times four, Larry. <laughs> Your horse, I'll beat it to death. She, who, among those many gifted Norway, uh, many gifted Maine women who took those eight notes of the musical scale to a horizon as wide as all the world. Minnie Plummer was born in West Paris, Maine on the 15th of April, 1869. She was an exact contemporary of my own grandfather, Herbert Adams. She was the only child, in fact, the only daughter of John Fellman Plummer and Zilpa Ann Marshall. What stories have come down to us indicate uh, that she was indeed a child prodigy of sorts. These stories are difficult to tell today. How much is remembered fondly, perhaps colored a little bit, as opposed to that which actually happened. But there are a number of stories that have the direct ring of truth to them about her childhood. It is said that when her mother would sing her to sleep with lullabies, that she would raise her eyes to her mother at the sound of a false note. In 1907, this was related in an interesting article by a faithful scribe named Eugenia Shepherd, who published it in Pine Tree Magazine in January of 1907 after an interview with Madame Scalar's own parents. It is as close as I suspect as we're going to get to the original material about uh, this woman because so much that she could have told us ourselves existed right into our lifetimes to almost we could touch it. I just vanished forever. We will know why. That very article says, quote, it is a long step from Paris, Maine to Paris, France. It speaks a resolution of iron and a pluck which yields neither to doubt nor to difficulty, unquote. Now, C.A. Stevens could have written those words. He wrote words very close to it. Sounds like him, and it sounds like the truth, too. And I suspect Eugenia Shepherd got that from her mother. Shortly after her birth, in the year 1870, the family moved to Norway, Maine. I would remind you that 1870 is the same year that C.A. Stevens, then 27 years old or so, was mounting the stairs of the Youth's Companion office in Boston, timorously knocking on the door with two stories stuck in his side pocket, what would in a few minutes become his first sale to the magazine that he was to be associated with for the rest of his life. At the same time, an infant child was moving to Norway, Maine with John and Zilpa. Little Minnie was taught largely by her mother and at home. Apparently, prodigy enough so that she was studying the piano at age six, having to sit on books to reach the keyboard. The family, shortly thereafter, moved to a place called Ivorytown, Connecticut. It still exists. The father, Mr. Plum, was in the piano building and sales business. Ivorytown, Connecticut uh, was where pianos were made, which also explains some of the few available artifacts we have left from the destruction of the Stevens Mansion. There's an elephant's foot wastebasket, there are carved tusks, silver inlaid objects made of ivory. And I have no doubt it is because of the plumber connection to Ivoryton, Connecticut, which was very near Bridgeport, Connecticut, where Jumbo the Elephant was soon to come to rest. 
in effigy, of course, after uh, P.T. Barnum allowed him, unfortunately, to be struck by a freight train and then stuffed. A fascinating part of the world in which to live, Connecticut. I wish I knew what she had thought of her life there. We do not know much, except that she studied piano in Essex, Connecticut, nearby. And it is said that she had five piano pupils of her own by the time she was nine years old. Somehow there is the ring of truth in that. I do believe it. In 1886, they moved back to Paris, Maine, and John Feldman Plummer announced he was going into business with J.F. Kennedy to open a shoe and clothing store with some musical instruments for sale on what was then Market Square in South Paris. The parents and Minnie lived above the store. A long stretch of stairs led from Market Square off to their second floor apartment which was decorated in the height of, uh, of uh, Victorian style, tassels, heavy wallpaper, lots of heavy old furniture from the pictures that we had. Young Minnie was 17 years old, and she then joined the First Congregational Church of South Paris, which of course still stands, where she played the organ. She then moved to Portland in the year 1887, from 1889, uh, studied and taught rather intensely, traveling to actually teach at Hebrew Academy, at least several courses, again, in music and in singing. The First Baptist Church of Portland called her to be its organist in the year uh, 1889, the month of October. She was 20 years old. And so she moved permanently for that moment down to Portland, down the Grand Trunk Line. She studied under Herman Kotzmar, the great organist and pianist and compositionist, uh, for whom the enormous organ in Portland City Hall is named. That's the Kotzmar Memorial Organ. Herman Kotzmar lived on 8 Walker Street, which is just up the street from where I live. He is a posthumous constituent of mine as a, as a state representative. And I've often thought as I walk the uneven bricks of the old street there that I'm following exactly when Madame Scalar often walked to go to school. She studied under also William H. Stockbridge, a great tenor of the time. He sang with the Rossini Choral Union in Lewiston in the 1880s. He was frequently on concert programs during the Civil War and the years later. He was a soloist for the Great Haydn Society in Portland, which still exists and still retains a complete log of all of their choral programs. She studied with the best that Maine could offer, the best locally that we had, and was perhaps recognized as the best in her own field. She was the organist at the First Baptist Church of Portland, the building now destroyed, unfortunately. She also was uh, organist for a time at the Congress Square Church. Regrettably, it's now also gone. But we do know that it, that is one of the churches where Christine Stevens, the wife of C.A. Stevens of Norway, Maine, occasionally visited the <coughs> church affairs. Is it possible that they ever passed each other on the side? She was later organist at Williston West Church, a beautiful building which still stands in the west end of the city of Portland. Christian Endeavor, the, the, one of the church youth groups famous in another era, was actually formed there. Remember, she's only 23 or 24 at the time. In 1892, I was able to find that she was boarding with Dr. Addison Thayer, interesting, Addison Thayer, at 639 Congress Street, which, need I tell you, is, of course, a parking lot today after I went to find it. But it was just up the street from the Longfellow Square, where the Longfellow Monument was only four years old. It was next to the brand new Portland Public Library that had just been donated by a man named James Finney Baxter, father of a young fellow just about the age of Madame Scalar, who would later on to become governor of Maine. Did she pass Percival Baxter on the street? I'd like to know. She was just up the street from the brand new, dedicated 1891 monument to the Civil War dead, the, uh, in the famous, what is now called Monument Square, within sight of her second floor windows would have been Union Station, built only four years before, the great train station in Portland. And should she have looked down Park Street in front of her to the waterfront, she could have seen white sails framed by the waving elms. Indeed, she was in the very heart of the city, the very heart of the cultural center of Maine at that time. In 1893, the city's directory indicates, quote, Miss Minnie A. Plummer has removed to South Paris, unquote. 
having returned again back to the uh, town where she had given her start. We do know also in that same year she had been making weekly trips down, I'm sure, down Congress Street, past the new library to Union Station, and then down to Boston on the train to study with uh, Professor E.A. McDowell, who was a German-American uh, pianist. At that same time, we know that in Boston, within an area of about three blocks, a young fellow named Thomas Edison was living and doing much of his early work. A fellow named Alexander G. Bell was experimenting with uh, conductivity experiments to aid the deaf in hearing. And a fellow named C.A. Stevens roomed at a house very close to where the other guys also roomed. Did she pass any of these three on the street? I'd like to think she might have. Likewise, she studied uh, with the great organ teacher Samuel B. Whitney, the father, later on, of the famous New England Conservatory of Music. So she has moved back, according to the Portland Directory, into South Paris. Actually, she has moved on into the world. She taught classes herself now in her early 20s, small groups on the piano and in the organ at South Paris, of course, and at Norway and at Bethel, and then sometimes in, in Portland. But what she really wanted was to have a taste of that wider world. And in the year 1895, at age 26, she set sail to Europe. Our first known photograph of her clearly dates from 1894, the famous one that you've seen many times before in the works of Dr. Whitney. This one, taken in 1894, when she would have been a young woman of about 25. What conversation passed between the anxious parents and the ambitious child? We do not know. But we do know that with some reluctance, her parents let her sail to Europe for the express purpose of studying music. Not so much at this time to sing, but to learn how to play, be even more accomplished on the piano and on the organ. We know from her pictures of that time that she was uh, possessed of light hair, she had a high brow, she had very clear eyes, and a very determined set to her mouth, all of which she carried on all through life. In Paris, she studied voice and uh, organ under uh, Alexander Willemont and the great Spanish tenor Antonio Trovadello. She also happened to have the good luck of meeting Madame Francesi, who was the daughter of the great Impressionist and as well traditionalist painter uh, Jean-Louis Ernst May. Massonet, who was much older than she, but the two became great close friends. She had fallen into the great circle of the greatest possible talent that existed in that part of Paris that it was possible to have bumped into. Massonet was a great friend of all the Impressionist painters. I wonder, is there any possibility she bumped into, knew some of these other people's friends, all of them? Is it possible? I don't know. It would be fascinating if the work, her own autobiography, which she was working on in her old age, had come down to us. After six months, she returned to the state of Maine and began to teach students again. But as the old song would say of the war that followed her generation, how are you going to keep down on the farm after they've seen Paris? And indeed, she'd seen the very best that there was to offer Paris. Her parents, however, we do know, did try to prevent her from leaving a second time, and indeed did prevent her for about a year in time, begging her not to return to such an uncertain uh, purpose in life, not to travel so far, not to leave them alone. But she did prevail in the year 1897. She sailed this time to Genoa, Italy, that is eastward, toward the rising sun. She had the great luck for 1897 to 1899 to study under Luigi Venuc Venuccini, great composer and conductor, a great friend of Giuseppe Verdi, one of uh, Italy's uh, leading elite in the music field. He sent her to sing before royalty, Queen Margherita, Queen of the Italians, in the year 1899. Once a year, the Queen asked for the best of all his students to be presented to her and to present a concert. Signor Luigi chose Madame Scolar. We know next that she went to Paris in the fall of 1898 to become the uh, private pupil, again, of Madame Marchesi, 
who was also one of the master teachers of Grand Opera. She completed her studies in the fall of 1898 and became uh, presented uh, more and more frequently in recitals by her great teacher. After one such performance, we do know, thanks to the research done by Dr. Whitney, that the French newspaper La Liberté said that Mademoiselle Plummer, a native of the land of dollars, will gain an ample provision of them in France when she shall have been heard in the Parisian world, when her beautiful voice, her excellent method, and her easy vocalization will not fail to produce the effect which they made upon us in the Champ Perdon and a great number of other items here by Rossini and others. This was high praise indeed for a still relatively unknown little American girl. Madame Scalar, uh, pardon me, Minnie Plummer, at this point, then had the great good luck to uh, return to a chateau that was the home of her, ma her friend Madame Francesi and make her home in a grand abbey named uh, Poissé, which did stand as recently as 1914. We have a good picture of it. We know exactly what it looked like. She had two rooms in that beautiful abbey. It was directly in the path of the invasion of France by the Germans in 1914 and again in 1940. I do not know if the uh, structure still stands today. I'm trying to find out. It would be fascinating to know if that much of her life is still standing after so much of her life here in Maine has long been lost. Mrs. Herman Kotzmar visited her in Europe at the Chateau in the summer of the year 1900 and heard her sing. She was deeply impressed by the great advancements made by her husband's former pupil. And we know that Madame Kotzmar wrote home, quote, after three years incessant study, a wonderful voice is trebled in volume, while losing none of its freshness and its sweetness. We predict that Maine, which has given the world a, a Madame Carey, a Madame Nordica, and a Madame Eames, as yet another gifted child of song, will in the near future bring added honor and renown the dear old pine tree state. Prophetic words indeed, and indeed it did come real. At this point, one story keeps floating into the narratives that you read about her. And I think too it has the ring of truth, in which at some point an unidentified teacher of music, listening to her sing, stops her and says, Madame, you do not have a contralto voice. Blowed her stomach to be told this at this point. Not a man. You have a bel canto soprano voice, Mademoiselle, turning what she had taken as a horrible halting into an enormous elevation. It took me some reading to understand why this is a compliment. Bel canto is Italian. It means beautiful singing, that which is supported entirely by breath, not breath. Madame Scalard did not play the heavy Wagnerian roles where uh, women come out wearing breastplates, horn helmets, carrying spears, and would look you know, so big and heavy that they look like they'd be pretty tough characters to meet even without the help of the spear. <laughs> Madame Nordica eventually gained this heavy girth and had to have special chairs built so she could sit comfortably in them, special opera costumes large every year. Madame Scalard didn't have to have this done. Madame Scalard. <clears throat> remained to the end of her days a, a smallish person with a very thin face and a very high voice. Bel canto would mean that it, uh, it gained in value, gained in frill, gained in volume, all supported by her ability to breathe and to project. In those days, there being no natural amplification, mean no uh, artificial amplification of any kind, other than that that you had. Bel canto was terribly uh, famous for its association with Rossini operas. Remember, she was very proud of her studies in Italian. Rossini is the man that wrote William Tell. We remember three or four bars of the great music that he wrote uh, because of their association with the masked man and his Indian companion. But he was a magnificent writer who wrote both words and music, and she excelled in singing these things. She was not in William Tell so far as I've ever known. This was an enormous compliment, but a new turn of events. It's like saying, Mr. Chu, you've sung bass for 42 years, but you're not a bass. You're going to be a tenor. 
and you would have to sit down and relearn all the roles, relearn all the parts, relearn all the methods of singing, which she set out to do. On the 15th of October, 1903, she made her debut at the Royal Opera House at The Hague in Holland, singing the lead in the opera, Aida. We'll talk about these operas in a moment. She was known to the Dutch after that as the darling of The Hague. The new current, the Neue Koran, of The Hague said that she, quote, sang gloriously every part without a fault, the strong and beautiful voice. And the Nuyen van der Dag, the news of the day, gave her even higher praise by saying that her singing was a divine gift, which she has well learned to use, portraying with equal skill the emotions of distress, anxiety, and joy. Now she's singing Aida. I am not an opera expert, so learning about Madame Scalar, my father's old friend, has been to me quite a learning experience. I'm not a great fan of opera, I will admit. I had always enjoyed the puns made by Kermit the Frog, who said the great opera Lohengrin was his favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and remember just thinking it was delightful when the Muppet Show did a takeoff on Rigoletto called Pigoletto, the entire cast of pigs. It was wonderful. And so learning about the world of opera has been to me a bit of a task, but it has also proved to be actually surprisingly fun. Aida, that she played the starring role in, is a significant role. And it is important that we remember that she played it. Aida was written by Verdi, was first performed in 1871, just about the time C.A. Stevens was going up the stairs to the Youth Companion's office. It's in four acts. Aida, the part she played, is the daughter of the King of Ethiopia, meaning she played it in heavy dark makeup, who is led into captivity by the Egyptians. She falls in run love with Radamus, an Egyptian warrior priest. And after many travails and rejections by his family and by her family, he is condemned to death. And they share a final scene in the Temple of Vulcan. The two lovers are entombed alive, collapsing into each other's arms for a last embrace. As they sing together, sad song o' earth, farewell, farewell, veil of tears, dream of joy, which vanished in grief, heaven opens itself to us. And the wandering souls fly to the rays of eternal day. I love thee forever. You can just imagine what the thunder of the drums rolling and all of that. And then the chemical lightning flashing and rolling cannonballs backstage to make thunder and all of that. It must have been quite the thing. It is an extraordinarily demanding role. Four act opera. These things started in late afternoon and went to late evening. She, rarely off stage at any time, singing the major role. Again, then, after two years in Holland, Minnie went on to London, where she sang in the fall of 1906, where we started the lecture today, and into the summer of 1907 at the famous Covent Garden. Only the really greatest artists sing there. To be accepted at Covent Garden places one at the pinnacle of the operatic world. If anybody has seen the play My Fair Lady, it is at Covent Garden that the connoisseurs of opera and the upper crust of British society, including Henry Higgins, and his old friend Colonel Pickering, are there to hear opera. And in the gutter, they bump into this little flower girl trying to petal roses upon them, Eliza Doolittle. It is a cold March night, the year 1906, fictitiously, the year that Madame Scalar is singing at Covent Garden. Eliza and Henry Higgins and Doolittle meet. It was deliberately chosen that way by George Bernard Shaw because he reviewed operas at Covent Garden. And when he came time to write Pygmalion, this was the pinnacle of the place you would go to hear beautiful singing. And the strangest place you could ever in your life hope to meet a flower girl on the gutter who would become something. It's not an accent, deliberately chosen for its offices, and she was at the very top, Minnie Ann Plummer. Quote, her success was instantaneous, says one paper. She proved herself an opera singer of the highest rank, but at the same time exhibited rare historionic ability. Her voice is rich and powerful. She sings with ease and fluency. The critics must record her best work in enthusiastic terms. This performance ranks among Covent Garden's best. At Covent Garden, she sang also the famous role, role of Lorelei, or Lorelei. I've heard it pronounced to me two different ways, and I'm not an Oxford expert. Again, a three-act 
mighty long production, first performed in uh, Turin in the year 1890, possibly she could have seen it uh, performed in one with its original cast in the years following. She played the orphan Loralee, who upon the banks of the Rhine is rejected by her suitor, Walter. So she promises herself to Alberich, the king of the Rhine, the spirit king of the Rhine, if he will transform her into an enchanting temptress. So he does. Walter loves her now, but since she's promised to the Rhine king, she must go and throw herself bodily into the, into the waters, and she does so. You can imagine that uh, how much of this takes three hours to, to describe going on, and the cannonballs rolling, and thunder, and chemical lightning, and all of that. And to be able to sustain your voice throughout all of that in such a demanding role is a remarkable thing. It was also at Covent Garden that Maya Mini sang the lead in Un Balo in the Mascara, that is, the masked ball, with the great Enrico Caruso himself. This is three acts. It was written in 1859, again by Verdi. It's based on a real, uh, a real uh, event in history, on the assassination of King Gustav III of Sweden at a masked ball in the year 1872. Ricardo, played by Caruso, is the governor of the local area. And he is in love with Amelia, played by our friend Minnie Plummer, who in fact is the wife of Renato, Caruso's great friend and chief advisor. Caruso is warned by a fortune teller that he will be killed by the next man who will shake his hand at the masked ball, which turns out, unfortunately, to be his best friend, Renato. Madame Scalar and Caruso had one rehearsal which has come down to us in history, because she told the story often. She is singing, he is singing, rehearsing, rehearsing. She says, where will you be standing? And he says, what do you mean, why do you care where I'm standing? And she says, because you have to die in my arms. He says, I die in your arms. I die in this opera? And she says, yes, you die in my arms in this opera. He says, well, well I, I did not. So she had to follow him throughout the entire latter half of the opera, keeping her eye on Caruso the whole time. Caruso, the story is actually typical of the man. He was a short fellow, probably not much taller than she was, so he weighed up in his uh, latter years as much as 250 pounds, sort of like a cannonball, both in volume and in shape. And not a man you want to have to fall into your arms without knowing he's coming. So Madame Scalar had to follow him around after he's shaken hands with Renato and is getting ready to die. Sing Sing, you know, oh, look, look for Caruso, chase Caruso across the stage, get ready for Caruso. And finally, when he hits the high note in which he dies, he falls traditionally backwards in her arms. She had to be there. She was. She didn't drop Caruso. That's not part of the story. But that is the, probably again, has the ring of truth to it. I suspect that really happened. She told that so many times. And I suspect it happened exactly the way she said Ricardo, that is Caruso, dies in Amelia's arms. He forgives all his enemies and he proclaims her innocence. And onward she goes. Another famous main artist who appeared at the same time at Covent Garden was Madame Lillian Nordica, born in Farmington, Maine. On one occasion, Madame Lillian Nordica was taken ill rather suddenly, and Minnie was requested to take her place at the next performance. So short was the notice, Minnie had barely time to put on her costume. She had her own costume, Madame Nordica's costume was a little big, and wouldn't fit her, <laughs> and sang the role without a rehearsal, without rereading the libretto, and without ever rehearsing with the orchestra. But she sang so well that the newspaper the next morning said that Madame Scalar did the part better than Madame Nordica, <laughs> which would not at all have pleased Madame Nordica. There is a lesson here. Madame Nordica had been born in 1857 in Farmington, Maine. She was 50 years old now. She was no longer on the top anymore. If she can be replaced at a moment's notice by a novice half her age, with no rehearsal, no reading of the libretto, no practice with the orchestra. Where does that leave Nordica in terms of the qualities of her performances? Madame Nordica had first performed opera in the year 1880 in old St. Petersburg, in one of the great theaters of the now restored, in fact, in St. Petersburg, in Les Huguenots, a role which, in fact, Madame Scalar later became famous, in which Minnie Plummer was earning, learning right then. What did it tell to someone like Madame Nordica about staying too long To someone as sensitive as Madame Nordica, I'm sure the lesson didn't go unlearned, or the moment passed unnoticed. 
to someone as sensitive and as ambitious as Madame Scalar, any plumber, I'm sure she was aware of the irony. Returning to France in the latter part of 1907, she began a great uh, engagement in Paris. The paper Le Figaro described her appearance at the Grand Palais, saying, the magnificent voice and the expressions uh, expressive air made a sensation in her role. The public and the orchestra made a veritable ovation for the young singer. And so she is established. She is at the top now of the heap. Between 1903 and 1910, the leading opera houses of England and France and Holland and Germany and Italy and Belgium echoed to the sound of her golden voice. Her ability to draw an audience was incredible. It's noticed often in the reviews. The very appearance of her name on a theater marquee guaranteed a very good turnout at the house. One of the wonderful articles that appeared 90 years ago this year is entitled A Main Girl's Great Success in Grand Opera at London. Madame Scalar, who scored such a triumph in Aida, is Minnie Plummer, born in South Paris, a second Nordica. A wonderful little thing here, which again has the ring of truth to it. Owing to the fact, here, this is her operatic debut 90 years ago tonight, Covent Garden, owing to the fact, which the British public holds dearly, that the first nighters kept away from the theater because of the leading artist, Minnie Plummer's obscurity, the London audiences. The next morning, therefore, the great London press critics, with a unanimity seldom known, hailed Signorita as one of the most wonderful ideas London had heard for years. One paper likened her to the Little Nordica of 20 years ago. Some, the same critic heard her in London. Others declared that she was the success of all successes. And after the grand ovation accorded uh, Madame that night, when the deafening applause had roused the audience to its feet and overwhelmed this little girl from Maine with the plaudits of the English-speaking tongue, she ran to her dressing room and by messenger sent this cablegram. Covent Garden, New York, October 17, 1896. Mr. and Mrs. J.F. Plummer, South Paris, Maine, unbounded success, Minnie. <laughs> Minnie apparently wrote to her parents every day from this point uh, on that she uh, traveled in Europe. Don't I wish we still had those letters? Mm -hmm. They existed at the laboratory to the very final days of the laboratory being a single entity. Madame Scalar, goes on to point out, is the stage name of Miss Minnie Plummer, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. J.F. Plummer, of South Paris, Maine, who by her individual efforts working out the story of self-helpfulness unaided alone with mind set upon the end has achieved the results which have been predicted by her great teachers. And indeed, there she was, unbounded success. We have charming photographs of her at this time, uh, charming little pictures of her at this time, because the press now begins to pick up on her personally. We know, for example, that she liked to collect porcelain and in her many tours through Europe, will go into the second and third and fourth backstreet shops and buy rare porcelain, which could be had for a song, if you knew what you were buying. Much of this came back. It was in the Stevens Mansion when it was finally disbanded and sold. How many homes in Norway and in Paris and in Oxford County have a piece of Delft China that Lillian, I mean, pardon me, that Madame Scalar had found in some back, work, back road shop in France? She kept a little American flag in her apartment at all times. And in fact, she even carried a little bit of the red, white, and blue tucked over her heart in every costume that she wore, she claimed, so that she could always sing with the American flag closest to her heart. That may be apocryphal. Lillian Nordica claimed to have done the same thing. Madame Scalar is delighted to see any of her old friends from Maine, goes on our friend in 1906 and talks lovingly of her own land. In her room there always hangs an emblem of that land, and there are white stars in their blue shield with a crimson that borrowed its hue from the hearts that bled for it, uh, very dear to her, says the author. Wherever she sings, a tiny silken American flag is worn under some bit of lace in her corsage, very near the heart that beat for it, beats for it so right and so loyally. In Paris, she was singing in the Trocadero, greatest halls, unfortunately now no longer standing, it's held 
7,000 seats. That's more than the population in her day, or in our day, of the towns of Norway and Paris put together. Every single human being in those towns, our towns, could have sat in the audience that night. And she wrote home to her parents saying, at last, mother, a room large enough to sing in without feeling afraid to let out my full voice. We have only these little clips of her letters. Don't I wish that indeed we had them all? At the Trocadero, she appeared in the opera Parodias as Salome. This is where she got her stage name, Scalar. And through the odd turns of the wheel of life, we have two pictures of her in that very role. These were pictures that she sent back to her parents, discovered by my friend Larry Glatz, two pictures, in the archives here of the Norway Historical Society. They are inscribed by Minnie Plummer to Mama and Papa. And on the back of each, it indicates that she is playing Salome in the great opera Herodias. In that opera, she was so good that the, it is said that the audience, or at least I suspect the newspapers, gave her a name that was to be her name, and she could use it as she chose. Scala, meaning the ascendant, the mighty. I was always told that it meant she who climbs the stairs, it does, or climbs the scales, it does. But a better translation of it is Madame, the ascendant, the rising star. What did Lily Norton? Madame is now at the top of her form and did in fact return to the United States on a rather interesting and long tour that took her all the way uh, first, to, uh, first to New Orleans where she opened uh, with a whole repertoire of these operas and uh, then returned back northward on a long swing that started in uh, Kansas City, Washington, Philadelphia, Boston, New York, went up to Montreal and to Quebec. And at that point, in May of 1911, she decided it would be good to come home and finally again see her parents, having been away now over 12 years. The arrangements were made for her to arrive on Friday, a certain Friday in May, which would have been her father's own birthday. Unfortunately, she got delayed in Quebec. A huge crowd assembled at the South Paris train station. She was unable to come. She returned home instead. Uh, a few days later, on the following Sunday, to be met by only her parents at the train station. But it was a grand reunion. The newspapers of the day said, this is the Lewiston newspaper, friends are greeted with a kiss and the most cordial of welcomes. Her hospitality has the ring of genuine feeling. Her manner is both vivacious and dignified. Her fine features are radiant. She is the mini plumber of a dozen or more years ago, plus the culture and finish that have come from travel, from study, from wide acquaintance and success with her art. Quote, I am so delighted to be here in dear old Maine, she said to the journal reporter, smiling a gracious welcome and voicing an unmistakable French accent. For she has spent most of her time abroad studying in Paris. How have you accomplished so much, is one of the questions wondering friends always ask her. When the tale of her musical conquests had been told, as she sits at last in her parents' home, quote, it's much in a definite aim and determination to succeed and perseverance, was her simple reply, unquote. Again, words that could have been written, indeed, by C.A. Stevens himself. But she had been away a long time. She had a repertoire of over 30 operas. She could speak fluent German, Italian, French, a smattering of Spanish and Portuguese, she now spoke English with a French accent. It seemed a little bit difficult for some people back in Norway, Maine, to remember that this girl, who after all had lived above the store, gone away and come back, gone away as Minnie Plummer and come back as Madame Scalar. She had seen more of the world than any other Norwegian, I would well imagine, except one, Charles Asbury Stevens came calling one day in the fall, in the, pardon me, in the summer of 1911. Minnie, meantime, was making plans for a grand hometown concert on the 7th of December 1911 in the new hall of the Oddfellows building in South Paris. My friend Van Conan tells me that that building, regrettably, has uh, since been destroyed. Here, she
she sang in a building packed from stage to balcony. Uh, some roles, uh, some, some songs from Les Huguenots, remember the role in which Madame Nordica had premiered in St. Petersburg in the year 1880. Uh, sang uh, in four languages, French, Italian, German, and English, and after prolonged applause, she came back for an encore, and instead of singing more opera, she sang Home Sweet Home. And the last poignant notes of that song faded away, said the newspaper articles. There was hardly a dry eye in the hall. She had put into her singing all the pathos and longing for home from one who had been away too long. She gave one more public concert on June 18, 1912, when she sang the commencement concert at Hebron Academy. The Hebron Baptist Church in which it was held was filled to capacity, and as the newspaper wrote, all were delighted with the opportunity of hearing her magnificent voice. However, she was set now to return to the concert church and go straight to the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. She never got there. C.A. Stevens came calling. It must have been a delightfully happy meeting. Many years later, Minnie said that at that meeting, C.A. Stevens reminisced about the first time he had met her. He, after all, being some 20 odd years older than when he, the very young C.A. Stevens, was, quote, induced to hold me in his arms as a baby, much to his embarrassment, unquote. But now it was entirely different, she said. This time he took me to his arms without embarrassment, and for 19 years of heaven I rested against his noble heart. It must have been a delightfully happy meeting, and she never looked back. Minnie Scalar never got all of her trunks home from Europe. Minnie Scalar never got all of her dollars home from Europe. She never sang at the Met. She never saw Europe again. But she never looked back. And now we come into the realm of personal memory. My grandmother who lived with us when I was little, Lillian. I can remember talking about the Stevenses a little bit when I was a little boy and would uh, visit her in the bedroom at night as she was getting ready for bed. I wish I could remember more, but I do remember that she said it was a bit uh, shocking to the town, a bit amazing to the town that this couple would pick up together. Annie Rich, who I used to talk to on my paper, who would always give me cookies, I would deliver the advertiser on Thursday afternoons, told me many times how she remembered seeing C.A. Stevens and Madame cut up like teenagers on the two-mile trolley that went between Norway and Paris. They just ride it back and forth just to be together. They could walk it almost as fast as that trolley would go they would write it just to be together. It was certainly a love match, and I think, honestly, it saved them both. Mylon Bennett, who I had the great privilege of knowing when I was a little boy, always told me that C.A. Stevens, who never learned how to drive, would be driven by him, Mylon, over to South Paris, to the little bungalow that the plumbers owned, Oak Acorn, still standing. And they would court in the living room while Mylon waited out in Rio, sometimes in the rain in the Rio, which had no roof, but Mylon would wait. The villagers of Norway and Paris watched the courtship with very, with great interest, and I would say with more affection than not. But it was probably considered an extremely unlikely union. And yet it came to pass on the day after Christmas, 1912, that C.A. Stevens and Minnie were married in a private ceremony at the First Congregational Church in South Paris, where some years before she'd been an organist as a little girl. There was no music to that ceremony. It was conducted in complete silence. She said, we heard our own music. I imagine that they did. They never looked back. He dedicated uh, several of his science books to her as his sweet singer. She always called him my dear, my doctor, my beloved, and abandoned all thought of continuing her own career and devoted herself exclusively to his life and his career without a backward glance or a sigh of regret. Her, public, uh, her voice was never heard in another public concert Although our friend Mr. Tucker can tell us, in fact, working in the fields one day, he did hear one of those rare opportunities where she did continue her singing. As I recall, you were plowing in the field, you heard her voice, boom, come blasting out from the tower out over the field. And it turned you into a She said, tell me that Google of a picture of that, singing to the land. I was about 500 feet out, out of the land, the field running about 500 feet from where she was a boy, telling you what it was. I could hear it just as when she was sitting this room almost, wonderful voice. I never forget that. I was about 13 years old. It 
It's a wonderful story. <laughs> and you're one of the last now who's ever heard her sing. I regret to say that I've been scouring the world hoping to find by now a recording of her. We believe she made them. We think she recorded for German Columbia in the year 1910. So far, neither the Library of Congress nor the Yale uh, Repository of Musical Collections nor the uh, Metropolitan has been able to come up with any trace of it. Now I'm, I've been writing to Europe to see if they have any such uh, recording. We do have Adam Nordicle's voice on uh, recordings, and so I suspect that it's indeed possible that hers exists too. It was not easy to make such an ending of a career, I'm sure, but it's a beginning. And here in 1912, we begin her second life, Larry. She was 42 years old. I'm sure she was remembering Madame Nordica. Madame Nordica would die in two years. Madame Nordica at this time was quite rich, quite accomplished, very successful, quite heavy, and was making the last of her world tour. She died in a shipwreck in Java, Indonesia, in the year 1914. But we have recordings of her, so I suspect there must be one somewhere Madame Scalar. She was 42. He was 68 years old. C.A. Stevens literally could have been his, her father himself. And in fact, C.A. Stevens' oldest daughter, Edna Harriet, was younger than Madame Scalar. Edna turned 37 about one week before the wedding of her father. He was, uh, she was only five years younger than her stepmother. And indeed, she bore C.A. Stevens' first grandchild in the year 1915. I have been told by the widow of Charles Stevens Delano, who was that child, that there was a race for the Stevens name. C.A. said to both of his daughters, Janet and Edna, that whoever had the first male son could have the privilege of naming the child Charles Stevens. Well, if it was a race, it was won by Edna, who was a medical physician herself, a medical doctor, of some accomplishment, married Arthur Delano, and produced young Charles Stevens Delano, in the summer of 1915, and he bore that name proudly to the end of his life, which took place uh, one month before I was scheduled to meet him in the year 1995. He was extremely proud of his grandfather, C.A. Stevens, but his widow tells me he carried his mother's own disdain for Madame Scalar and always referred to his mother's uh, stepmother as Madame, as did all his family. There are probably reasons for this, and this is the difficult beginning of the second half of Stevens' life. C.A. was a brilliant man, but probably not an easy one to leave with, live with in many ways. He believed, for example, that only $10,000 should be left from any one generation to the next generation. That's not a small amount of money. In, in the year 1910, a dollar was probably worth 20 of our American dollars today. He's speaking of leaving almost a, you know, a, a quarter of a million dollars to your children. But nevertheless, he didn't believe that each generation should do more than that to the next. All the rest of the money should be put into a fund that would be for massive scholarships for American students to do steamship colleges or things like that. It, uh, it separated C.A. from his two daughters, who had expected a little bit more of a legacy. C.A. was bitterly disappointed that his daughter Edna, who became an M.D., did not choose to come home to work with him in his search for immortality, which we discussed two years ago at the lecture here. Because don't forget, 1911 is the year that C.A. Stevens had said in one of his great books that the, he and his fellow Prometheans would all gather at the laboratory and he would mount the roof on the 1st of May, 1911, and swing his hat and say, come fellow Prometheans, come help do this thing. No Prometheans came and no daughter either. Instead, a new wife comes home to the laboratory. And this is the laboratory that she came home to. Thanks to the good agency of our sharp-eyed and, and good friend, Sid Gordon, we have had preserved for us a picture of the, observe, of the laboratory as it probably was in its first form. I have just received as a gift from uh, John Pullen, author of the 20th Maine, this picture of a laboratory enlarged. You can see that the dome has changed tremendously. There was a third version of the laboratory that I don't have a picture of, where this dome was sheathed over entirely in metal and looked like a great beehive. But this was the laboratory to which Madame Scalar came. This photograph was taken by my own grandmother, Lillian Adams Cummings, for the 
uh, as a keepsake from my father, the year he went into, he was drafted for a second world war, along with pictures of all the rest of Norway Lake. This enormous structure grew like Topsy, and now had in it exactly two 